males and females for the sport of ice hockey. So that's that's kind of a split screen. It's pretty it's pretty neat how that's done. But the title of this presentation is physical preparation for ice hockey players. So there I am. There's a few letters, right? Yippee. Um, I'm not from here, as everybody knows. You can already hear that in, in my voice. Uh, I'm from the East Coast. I moved here five years ago. I met my wife out here in 2012, and, uh, well, she hooked, lined, and sick at me. So here I am, right? Uh, I might have met a, a couple people here before. I'm really not sure, but I'm just going to kind of get into this. So the learning objectives today, we're just speaking about training athletes to prepare them for sport and don't forget we're also preparing them for life <laughs> and that that needs to be like yeah. the big takeaway like we need to physically prepare them also mentally prepare them make sure that they're right in their head and biomechanically they're right in their body so learning objectives i'm gonna go over the journey quick everybody's got a journey Make sure you get food. I can keep talking. I'm going to keep you guys moving. I know somebody has to leave early, so I'm going to make it worth your while. Okay? Uh, I'm going to explain what a variety pack is in relevance to our facility. The chunk of this presentation will be on the long-term athletic development model, LTAD. Well, you'll hear ADM. One is from Canada. One is from the United States. They are pretty much the same thing. There'll always be a debate on that, though, right? Somebody's going to read something and say, technically, no. It, it might be a friggin' letter that's off, okay? So uh, stages of learning, logic, and then questions and answers. So I'm going to move, and I'm going to keep you guys engaged and make sure that everybody's good. So my journey, uh, huh, here it is. Went to Springfield College. I'm from Massachusetts. Graduated Springfield College. Played football. Uh after I went to Springfield College, I went to Boston College. I went to graduate, graduate school at Boston College. I was a graduate assistant for, for football from 2007 to 2008, 9. Okay, so uh, fantastic teams, fantastic athletes on that team. Uh, worked at Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning for seven years. Uh, Boston University men's ice hockey. Exos, formerly known as Athletes Performance. Was at Minnesota Duluth with the Bulldogs for a year or two in 2017, 2018. Uh, now general manager at Sanford Power. I've worked with, you know, that bottom half all has to do. Oh, geez, you know what? I've never even looked at it like this. That bottom half all has to do with North Dakota <laughs> and Minnesota. And the top half is, well, my previous life. So that wasn't even intentional. So I just came to realization that's kind of cool. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to just keep moving. Uh, so a variety pack. Our facility is a variety pack. What do we train? We train kids, males and females, at a youth level. We train high school athletes, okay? In addition to the high school athletes, we train collegiate athletes and professional athletes. That's, that's just part of our deal. That's what happens underneath our roof. Simultaneously, we train adults from all ages like yourself, okay? Our job is to get people right. It's to teach them how to exercise properly so that they don't get hurt. It's to teach them how to exercise properly so they have a better life, okay, in relevance to movement, okay? You either move or you don't. It's kind of one or the other, all right? So um, our kids, there's an example of a hockey team. Might have been a national championship game. Uh, we try to teach cohesion in our facility. We try to train kids to stick together through exercise, through effort, through accountability, to showing up early, to not showing up late, to eating right, to going to bed early, to keep themselves in shape, to keep, the mental, to keep themselves mentally and physically right. So in the end, we can all peak together. All right? that's, that's a big deal when you can get everybody on the same exact page trying to accomplish the same goal. That's a big, big, big deal. So everybody, everybody goes through a different road, but everybody in here, whether it's the hardware or the goalie, okay, or the goal in a tournament game against Yale or a gold medal, okay, my wife or a bean pot victory, it all has to do with training. 
all these people every day go through some type of health and wellness process to keep themselves right to become a better athlete mentally and physically. So what's the LTAD? So let's look at this really quick in relevance to this community when it comes to training hockey players. And not just this community, but I got to say this community because I'm literally in your community, okay? <laughs> um, most of the problems that exist in youth and in high school players, or sports rather, they result, that's not cordless. All right, screw it, I'm just going to talk. I can't say so long, sorry guys, okay? As you can tell. They result from inappropriate application of the win-oriented model of professional or elite sports and sports child settings. So basically what I'm saying is here, in order to develop the qualities needed to excel on the ice, to skate faster, to have more explosiveness, to have a bigger first push, stride length, reactivity, okay? Don't get knocked off the puck. In order to develop all those skills, Players need to be exposed to multiple stimuli at early ages, both on and off the ice. So the first stimuli that I would talk about would be training. But that's just not training. That's also playing other sports. Hockey is a late specialization sport. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. This is going to piss people off, right? Early specialization, routine-based, highly technical, specific movement qualities such as swimming, boxing, gymnastics. Okay, late specialization, highly technical. Decision-making efficiency, just keep that one in mind, all right? Movement variability, another one to keep in mind. Visual tracking, another one to keep in mind. Team sports, okay? The answer to enhanced skill development along with getting stronger, it doesn't reside in playing more hockey games and childhood activities. This model seeks to maximize athletic potential while sustaining passion and long life love for the sport. So let's look at this model. Now that TV, it's a little whack, but we're going to get it done. Ages six to nine. From the ages of one to six, I wouldn't try, like, like I, I got kids right now, right? Your child is too, like, I got a, a, a three-year-old this week on Saturday. I have a nine-month-old, and my wife is pregnant. Now, every, well, some people here have already been through that process. So you know when you're staring at your two-year-old, right, he might be swinging a dinosaur through the window. Or, you know, he might be jumping off a snow bennet. Or who knows, right? Um, I don't know what he's going to do. I have no idea. I'm going to try to just have him absorb everything possible before the age of six. When they're at six to nine – it's still pretty similar. They have to physically become literate, right? Like we got we got our kid on skates three or four times, just trying to get him to stand, right? It's not going to be Brett Hull tomorrow, right? We're just trying to get him to stand. Let's balance it up a little bit. But speed, ABCs, window. Somebody came in to Kyle and I and said, hey, I need you to train my eight-year-old because then the next Jack Eichel, which has happened, which has happened, is a had Jack in Boston, right? God, I mean, sorry, man. Jack didn't peak till he was about 16. I mean, he had this increased decision making in his head, and he was overly strong for his body. But other than that, he just, you know, I mean, he moved like any other kid, right? You can't train an eight year old to be a number two overall draft pick in 2015. You can't, you can't do that. It's not a magic pill, right? We can teach the eight year old in that window. But the eight-year-old isn't going to lift the weight. <laughs> it's not going to happen. That's just negligent. But then you start moving up this chain. You start going, okay, stage two, nine to 12, these kids are learning how to train. So now it's like, okay, my kid is probably between that fourth and sixth grade age. They're starting to become more confident consciously. Maybe not unconsciously yet. They're not automating completely. But it's like, hey, you know, stand for power. All right, go oh. World's greatest training facility. What do you do with a kid like this? Well, we're going to teach him how to be supple. So be mobile. Crawl. Hold themselves off the floor. Twist, turn. Right? A lot of gymnastic S to it. Right? Skill. Yeah, we'll teach him a skill. Maybe you're going to jump. Maybe you're going to jump laterally. Land on two legs. Maybe you're going to catch a ball. Cool. We can do that. Right? Um, motor coordination. Balancing on one leg. 
right? Maybe closing one eye, maybe learning how to bend your knee, maybe visualizing something here or grabbing something like and taking it and putting it up. Like we're going to work all that stabilization because it's going to create a better motor coordination. But that's what we're going to do in that window. We're not going to back squat a 12 year old yet. <laughs> right? I mean, we might give him like a rubber barbell like Tahiki has, right? But, you know, his, his daughter's too, so she, she got, what, is it made out of rubber? It's plastic. It's plastic. It's a plastic barbell, right? So, but stage three, ages 12 to 16, that's when you start looking at that 12 to 16 year old and you start going, okay, we're in a train to train stage. We can look at this kid now and we can say, okay, you know what? Yeah, you've got some cred. You're a good hockey player or you're a good football player. You're a good baseball player, whatever it is. Okay, we're going to talk hockey in here. All right, you're either goalie or you're not, basically. And, you know, do they rotate well? Are they stopping pucks well? Do they have a good eye? Do they have great visualization? Can they shoot? Are they fast? Just name all the attributes. But either way, all those attributes are going to get better if a kid gets stronger. They're just going to. You just have to think. When I say stronger, I don't mean bulky and big. I mean strong. When I say strong, it's Newton's second law. It's force production. Force equals mass times acceleration. That's all it is. The more forceful these legs can get, the more forceful these glutes can get, okay? And the more this can absorb, and the more forceful this can be in multiple planes of motion, the better you're going to have, uh, the better athlete you're going to have. I will, I will bet my life savings on it because nobody ever got worse because they got stronger. <clears throat> but it's getting stronger the right way. And that's what I'm here to talk about. At 16 to 18, you're training to compete. So that blue and yellow stage, you're going into that physical excellence zone. But then on top of this, and this is what I did, you know, if I did more research on anything, it's probably the top piece of this model. You're training to win, but then you're training for life. And that's a big one because the big ticket item is, uh-oh, all right, we got a, we got a little typo. Performance training is a necessity. Because when the hour of performance arrives, the hour of preparation has come to an end. So everybody, you know, the haze in the bond. That's what one of my bosses used to tell me all the time, right? If you're reading my wife's book, that's quoted in there, all right? So one of them really liked it. I said it one day. I can't say bond, but I said it, all right? But like the haze in the bond, and that's not, you know, speaking that because all we got is farm around here, but it's like it's the truth. If you don't physically prepare yourself to play the sport of hockey, at some point, your flame is going to run out, right? At some, at some point. It just is what it is. Now, there's always the exception. Well, I can drink a 30 rack. I can go skate and score goals and be better than everybody else. There is the exception, right? Probably not in that, you know, probably not through stage, you know, or well, one through five. Maybe maybe after that, though, okay? Just play immensely. All right. So fundamentals. Here we go. So this is now – this is a really good breakdown – because obviously everybody's here for our kids. So fundamentals age six to nine. So let's go through it. Because a six to nine year old can train. They can train. But how do they train? Fundamentals. So we got it's a it's a obviously a important time period where you know emotionally they're gonna tie to the sport. They're going to probably watch their favorite player on TV, or they're going to look at mom and dad, try to emulate a little bit. They're going to look at something and say, hey, I want to do that, which is really cool. Small area games. This is going to make sense to everybody. Small area games. <laughs> Multiple repetition, authentic skill, acquisition through trial and error process. They, by now, if everybody has a kid over the age of six, everybody knows what that is. Uh, that says agility, balance, and coordination. It's your first biological window where you can actually start increasing speed. And the way you increase speed in a little kid is you just teach them how to run. And then you give them an embodied belief that they're going to be fast. That's it. There's no magic to that. Right? The kid's not going to be Herschel Walker tomorrow sprinting up a hill or Walter Payton sprinting up a hill. You can sprint them up the hill. They're not going to go extremely fast, but you can at least get them up there and start teaching them, hey, run an incline. Go ahead. It's not going to hurt you. Right? Or tell them, you know what? I need you to pop your foot through the floor and explode as fast as you possibly can. They're going to go, okay, coach. Yeah. And then I'm going to go, okay. And because, you know, you tell them a dad, right? Because I get all 
freaking up here and I get energized about it and it's fun. But it's fun. And that's the mental aspect. If they believe that they're getting faster, right? Like monkey see, monkey do. You put a hurdle here and you go and you run and you jump over it. Chances are they're going to look at it and they're going to go, I can do that. I'm fast. Cool. That's the stuff that you teach at this age. This window occurs in females at approximately six to eight years of age and in males at approximately seven or nine. Not a huge difference. I put the female piece in because little girls should be doing the same thing. It's got, it's got to go hand in hand. That's why I put it. Nine to 12. Learn to train. Here we go. Introduction of motor coordination. So now we're really teaching them specific patterns of their body. Every kid is going to learn how to do this. At the age of two, they have to go to the bathroom. Okay? So, yeah, they're going to learn a two-leg squat. But now maybe we're introducing motor coordination to a 9 or a 12-year-old, and maybe instead it's a split squat. Okay? I'm trying to give examples. Because now we take a bilateral exercise, and now we give them a unilateral exercise, change the whole stimulus. Higher demand of motor coordination. Higher demand of energy through their body. Higher demand of uh, core engagement. Now, they're throwing, they're receiving, they balance. And basic unloaded patterning, such as squatting, just did squatting, pushing. Immediately, if I gave you a chest exercise, what's the first thing that comes to mind as a high school junior? What do I got to do? Come on. I got a bench press, right? I'm bench, man, right? Everybody's like, I got a bench. Well, teach him a push-up. Teach him a push-up, okay? At that age, let, let's get him let's get doing a push-up, right? And then maybe week one, they do eight. Week two, they do 10. Week three, they do 12. And then what do we do? We bench it. Ah, you know what? They're still young. We might not have to load these kids yet. Let's just elevate their feet on a chair. Challenge the surface. That's how we're going to get these kids stronger. And that's how we're going to have them learning how to train. We're not thinking weight yet. Not yet. But when I say pulling, good old pull-up. Right? Hasn't gone away. Should never go away. Okay? But basic upper body strength. Can you decelerate? Can you accelerate in a vertical plane? Creating muscular strength and endurance. And hinging. Hinging. It's, it's like a duel. Right? Like this is a squat pattern. This is a hinge pattern. Okay? Hinging is predominantly a hip dominant exercise. It's extremely important for hockey players. It's extremely important for hockey players starting at that age all the way through the rest of their life because their hips are constantly flexed. Constantly. You ever look at a hockey body? I, I, bet I can stand you right up right now, but it's like this. Uh, okay? And then I do it again. Uh, right? Like my wife, by the time her Olympic career is done, it's like curve like this. And they're like, ah, uh, well, what do we do? We need to move their hips. They lack hip extension. And then if anybody skated, right, <laughs> get off the ice after an hour and a half. Tell me how your hips feel. Shot. Flexors, right? Hip flexors. So we need to hinge to give them more hip extension. So if we're doing a ratio of hip extension versus squatting in our facility, we're going to have two hip exercises for every squat. It's just going to save their hips. But dynamic warm-up, you're going to introduce these guys on movement economy, stability, and dynamic mobility. You're developing movement literacy in this, in this stage. It's a foundation of anything that becomes specific down the road. If a kid cannot stand on one leg and is falling over, chances are that one leg is not going to get stronger and it's going to really apply to sport in the wrong way. Okay? Um, it's wise to understand that weight training isn't advised in this window. Big surprise, right? So I'll put the cap on that ball. All right, here are my little guys right here. It's the first year I moved to North Dakota. Bunch of, you know, you got you got some, I guess, you know, for this community, I guess I have to use it. You got some current North Dakota hockey players. I never thought I'd say that, right? But you do. But these kids, best part of both these kids, not only, you know, they're all hockey players, right? You know, Tiffany, I don't think she was having it that day. Um <laughs> It's okay, it's a great picture. All right. These kids, what I studied with these kids is specifically what I studied with them too is physical self-perception. They lifted for a whole summer. 
they all got strong. Even little Whitey in there. He's the smallest kid, right? He wore a sleepless shirt that day. Right? <laughs> he, but he had fun because, you know what? We did some bicep curls. Everybody took a picture. But every kid, besides Tiffany, because she just wasn't having it, okay, a little more confident, you know? They spent a whole summer lifting weights, running, you know, cutting, pivoting, doing all the exercises that we try to give them um, to make them a better athlete. So they were more confident. So chances are, if you're physically self-perceived as more confident, you have a higher chance of performing better. That would be the intent. So what's great about this stage now is that now you have a hormonal dump, a hormonal effect. Okay, it's called PHV. It's called peak height velocity. It's a maturation point for the human body. It's a little blinking light that tells you, you hit puberty, you can lift. It's the best way I can put it. I use maturation too. Like, that's all it is. You hit it, time to lift. Now we got an open window, so what do we do? But this is doing it safely. There's intent to this. We're not going to do this with a nine-year-old, okay? Structured strength, strength training. Uh, I'll say that three times. Structured strength training and conditioning may take place. Your, your cardiovascular system, it's ready for larger demands. You can handle more, okay? Onset, there it is right there, peak high velocity. It's wise to choose one to two other sports with non-competing schedules to allow this athlete to further refine their biomotor skills. I'm a hockey goalie. Not a bad idea to go play lacrosse for a little bit, right? If I'm a lacrosse player, not a bad idea to go play some tennis. If I'm a tennis player, not a bad idea to go run some cross country. If I'm a cross country runner, not a bad idea to go to a boxing ring. See what I'm saying? It all relates. It ain't gonna make you worse. It's not gonna make you a worse athlete by becoming more athletic. And that's that's what I'm trying to get around here too, because this holistically, you know, it enhances this model with multiple stimuli. Lift, sprint, and learn how to eat and sleep better. If you just chalk training up to like four things, that's it. Just watch Rocky. <laughs> that's it's what it comes down to, right? So here we go. We're rolling here. We're rolling. I'm keeping, being cautious of time. I don't want to make somebody. You know, I don't want to make somebody late. Hate being that guy. Uh, trying to compete. There's Jason. Jason Alma. Jason and I are friends. He was a hell of a hockey player. I got nothing but respect for him as a hockey player. So now you're focused. Now your kids getting older. Okay, and your focus now it's general to specific. You start getting the age of 16, 18. And you can start looking at things. You start going, okay, hey, look, my kid can play. Like, yeah, you know, we're gonna we're gonna stick with hockey. But it's like, hey, you got to make a decision now within a year. You know what? I think you can put hockey somewhere. Cool. All right, let's have him play. What's he going to do? What are we going to do to develop this kid now? Now it starts getting a little bit more specific. So now you periodize. And spe specific position training now gets introduced. Okay? And I'm going to hit on that because it doesn't mean, oh, I'm a hockey player. Here I go. Boom, boom. Stop rotating and slap, slapping a barbell. It's not like that. It's not like that. We have rotated athletes. Every hockey player goes through multiple series of rotations. Did everybody agree? They rotate. Okay, so off the ice, we have to train them to, to absorb that rotation, to be an anti-rotator. So specifically training a hockey player doesn't mean we're going to rotate them in the offseason. We're going to give them some degrees of rotation, but we want to be able to harness that torque in the off season. So when they go back out on the ice and they shoot a puck, they go, damn mom, damn dad, that thing's firing a little hot at them, right? Like we're creating a slingshot by not overworking the muscles that they use on the mm -hmm. ice. It is fun, it's fun, right? It's fun, it's, it's yeah. fun. Especially it's fun when somebody's actually like engaged in it and you actually love it. Like I friggin' love it. I love it. And I love it so much because it does nothing but create a positive vision for a kid. Okay, periodization means strength, tra so training in periods. It's structured training, okay, it's structured training. You divide your annual plan into transition, preparation, and competition blocks. Transition, preparation, competition. How do I do this all day for a living? Like we literally destroy weakness for a living. 
think about it, strength and conditioning coach, right? So when we do this, we look at it and we go, okay, we're in season. These grand forks right now, that's like, that's our, that's our team. We love it, okay? Green Wave last night, you could have, they could have worked out four times before that game last night, but whatever. They won like 15 to nothing. It's awful. Um, you look at them, you look at their season, hockey season, even in high school, college, whatever it is, you know, high school, college, NHL, it's a long, long, long season. Juniors, a long, long, long season. So you have to look at that and you have to go, okay, well, I'm in competition for these next four months. How do I create a plan for all these kids? What do I do in season versus off season? Well, off season, maybe I have split squats, four sets of five, four sets of eight. But in season, I might only have one set of those. But I still want to lift and work that pattern so they don't become weaker. So in other words, we're constantly playing chess with the calendar because we have to make sure that we transition properly during competition periods. We prepare properly during competition periods. Vice versa, we want to prepare well during preparation <laughs> periods off-season, and we want to create a positive transition when off-season becomes in-season and in-season becomes off-season. There's a lot to it. It's not just, you know, a barbell and a, you know, you know Metallica, right? There's more to it. There's intent. So without physical literacy established, specificity, it's compromised. And when I mean specificity, guys, you go on the internet. It's a cool hockey exercise. I'm going to take one leg. I'm going to stand on a blue bosu ball. I'm going to close one eye. I'm going to juggle two kettlebells and see what sticks. Okay, if the kid has no physical, first off, it's an awful exercise, but if the kid has no physical literacy, right, first, get they're going to ass over tea kettle is happening, for sure. And then they're going to get hit with a kettlebell, knock themselves out, get a concussion, all right, and then you get a medical bill. Like that's, that's what I, that, it all leads, right? It all leads. So we have to educate and be like, oh, look, like, you don't need to do any fancy. Squat's a squat. Push is a push. Hinge is a hinge. Pull's a pull. Let's work with that stuff first, but we need to teach that in the early stages, right? So then I can take an NHLer who just played three games in a row, right? And then I look at McCann on the Kraken, and I go, man, look, you had a lot of time on ice. The squat that him, him, and him are doing today for the four sets of four at 80% of your one rep max, you know what? They're going to do two sets of that. But I need you having 50% of your one rep max on your bar, and I just need you to do three jumps. Because he's so loaded right now. Because he's playing in so many games and his minutes are so high. But he is physically literate to perform that light exercise. He's physically literate to deload or reload. You can't do that with every athlete. See, they adapt so well, but they adapt so well because of that physical literacy. Moving on. Everybody good? Pretty good? We don't need to shake it out or anything, right? I'm not like Tony Robbins. Nobody's going to like stop coming up and, oh, great. What was it? Not sorry. Richard Sins, right? <laughs> we don't need that. Uh, 18 plus, train to win. That's a pretty special picture of my wife. That was, that was, that was great. It was great. I was so happy for her. You maximize all performance abilities. You're physically prepared. That's the big one, though. Psychologically is a big one, right? People get to an elite level because psychologically they're in tune and they can make decisions that nobody else can make and they can make them fast and they can adapt fast. Okay, and they can pivot quick and then they can persist. A lot of people can't pivot and persist. They can only pivot. So it's, it's a big deal. That psychologically prepared piece is a big deal. Technical and tactical abilities are, are you know, they're retained. Practice to game ratio is reduced. The athlete is provided more time to focus on their training economy and skill set refinement or improvement. When you get to an Olympic level, like you can continue to obviously work the skill. That that's right. I, everybody in here has a skill of some sort. If not, then you're not making any money. Like we all have a skill. We have to constantly be, you know. And, and it's not just hockey. It, it's everything. You never truly arrive. You always want to strive for something better. You can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, right? Shit, you could be a loan shop for all I know, but you could do your job better. Everybody can do a better job. Their skill development always has to be refined. 
So yeah, they're going to go, they're going to shoot. They're going to stick handle. They're going to do the specific drills on the ice that is going to make them better, but they're going to constantly train as well. So they can keep refining those skills by training strength and conditioning because those skills can die out if you're not in shape, right? What if somebody gains 20 pounds and they haven't done anything? How those highways going to look on the ice if you gain 20 pounds? Probably not as efficient. So now, as my ladies, right, that's at Duluth, great group of girls. That's one of the favorite groups I've worked with. They were just good. Um, this is important because training for life, you get a better opportunity to be active for life if physical literacy is achieved. Right, Kyle, how many kids have you seen? Like, we have kid ass, right? This kid never worked out in his life. This kid came in the gym, right, and... Oh man, like this was two years ago, and you just talking posture, awkward, right? Like you felt bad. Like this kid, we can only have him do like three or four things. I'm not dogging on him and making fun. Of him. I'm not in the business of making fun of kids. Absolutely not. That's not my deal. I'm just giving an example. He needed help. Okay, we needed to create physical literacy for him. I mean, he couldn't even do a push up. One push up. You know how crappy he felt at. Probably not good while everybody else was doing it. So we help him. He comes in, right? He's like a different kid now. His hair's bigger and he's, you know, I mean, it's not that. He also hit that PHV piece, right? Which helped out a lot. But he's not as unconfident as he was. Kyle, I'm going to give Kyle the credit for that, but because of Kyle, he had some physical literacy. More confidence. Now he's playing two sports. Didn't play anything before. He's a couch potato, right? That's a big deal. When you can impact a kid, that's a big deal. And I know we're talking hockey, but hockey players can be impacted like that too. Absolutely. Playing multiple sports at an early age enhances the probability of an athlete developing a lifelong love for physical activity. Right? Get out and freaking play. Do it all. Do it all. See what sticks. If you're good enough, you're going to get noticed. And if you're good enough, you're going to excel. But you've got to train because health and wellness, be, it's got to become a habit instead of a burden. Kids can't drain, you can't dread training. We're not the guys where you come in and you go, start yelling at you, right? Get in your face, get up, you know? I mean, at times, like, you want to push kids, but you want to push them correctly. I had, I got four kids, two mornings a week. They're 13 and 14 years old. I get a ton out of them, and all I got to do is just have, hold my pencil and just be like, no, it wasn't good enough. Do it again. But oh, shit, I gotta do it again, right? Because you just you don't need to like install fair in a kid. You just go. Where the hell did my highlighter go? That's not good. I can't I can't speak without my highlighter. I think I dropped it. That's okay though. I'll just hold this. It's kind of a I don't know what you call it. Training for life also consists of uh, becoming a better human. You want to know how to train specifically for hockey? Cool. This all applies to hockey. Being accountable applies to hockey. Putting in more effort applies to hockey. Eating better applies to hockey. Being a better person applies to hockey. Going to bed early applies to hockey. That all applies to hockey. That's hockey-specific training, too. It, it's a big deal, right? Hey, bud, look, I need you to wake up. Hey, no, I can't have you wake up at 7 for a 7.30 workout. I need you to wake up at 6, shut the phone off early, maybe to read five pages of a book. I don't know what you're into, right? Shut it down. Wake up, get a meal in you. I don't care if it's just a chocolate milk. Something's better than nothing. Kickstart the goddamn engine. And then go lift, and then you're going to feel way better for your day. I promise you. And class isn't going to suck as much, okay, because you got your exercise in. I'm just speaking logically here. Because guess what? Believe it or not, yeah, I've been through it. I've been through it. I played so, I played so many sports. I played football forever. And I'm, I'm smaller than every kid, but I put my – Freaking hot and soul into it, okay? And I loved it, and I still do. I don't, I don't regret it down. But we just do all these little things, and because of all these little things, I, I, I love the job I have, okay? It goes longer than sport. So when we talk stages of learning, player development, that's all. We're trying to get people to be unconsciously competent, okay? Proper skill is executed effortlessly without the thought. But none of that happens without that physical literacy first. You guys can all, everybody can read here. Everybody can see that, okay? So, uh-oh. 
Yeah, I mean, unconsciously incompetent, that's how everybody comes into the gym if they've never been. And you create conscious incompetence, but it's all repetition in the end, everybody. It's doing the simple things savagely well. We want people to automate. You want kids to come in and be able to say, I'm going to set up my rack. I'm going to put my barbell here. I'm going to put this here. I'm going to lift for 15 minutes at this station, and then guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to clean it up. That's also hockey-specific training. I'm going to clean up. And guess what, parents? You're going to be thankful at home. Maybe the kid will wash a dish because it's the right thing to do. I hate doing the dishes, but I do them, right? So five S's in their development. Speed, skill. Speed, guess what? Train it, train it, and just keep training it. Speed is embodied belief. It's an embodied belief first. You've got to believe you're going to be fast. You have to have a kid see fast. Put on planet Earth. Put on planet Earth. Volume one, season one, episode one. No, episode two. The first thing you see is a goddamn cheetah. Making my son, whoa, look at that guy. He fast. Right now, I keep telling him, be fast, be fast, right? Because I want him to be fast. Be fast. Cheetah's fast. Fast, fast, fast. You start seeing that in somebody's head over and over and over, and you just keep training it. I don't think they're going to be slow, all right, <laughs> at least for a temporary amount of time. But there's something about that external cue. Let's go. Push your foot through the floor. Push the floor away from you. Push it away from you. Push it away from you. On the ice, push the ice away from you, right? On the ground, push the turf away from you. Forward, forward, forward. Skip. Sorry. Skill, learn to train, supplement this. Learn to train, train to train. Everybody in this room, suppleness will save your life because you got to move. We all have to move. Okay, stamina, train and train beyond. Nobody got worse having more stamina. And then strength, train and train beyond. It's really simple. Get them stronger, have them endure, keep doing it. The bottom line is that hockey players need a variety of unverified exposures in an ever changing learning environment without early specialization or sports-specific drills that focuses just on a winning outcome. It can't just be a ball. Yeah, you got to win. You can't just focus on outcome. Yep, that's it right there. You need to go there. It's how are you going to get there. And it's training, and it's hockey, and it's football, and it's wrestling, and it's volleyball, and it's playing outside jumping in a pool, maybe you have a girlfriend or boyfriend here and there, right? Like, you're going through that whole journey. That's what it's about to get them that optimal outcome. There's a lot of ebbs and flows in there. That's what we're trying to train. So adapt the athlete. <laughs> That's Nick Roberto. Nick was a transfer from the University of Maine. He was the best thing that ever happened to the team in 2014. Players develop during free time, not in, not in the competitive expedience of game two-hour practices or excessive hockey school skills. Maximize the free time. Train. Uh-oh, computer. Skills are necessary. Setting out, you know, as they do the limits of anything, more is needed to trans transform those skills into something special. Training. All right, Mike. TV is getting me here. Mostly it is time for an unencumbered Unhurried time of different quality, more time to decide what works versus what doesn't. So Bobby U.S. said it. Everybody know Bob? I mean, look, I said this before. People didn't know. Does everybody know who Cam Daly is? I had a show of hands before I placed. Nobody knew. <laughs> and I was like, that's not much of a hockey talk. <laughs> oh, but I was in the corner and they just looking at me like crazy. I mean I'm, I know it's Boston right but like it's not just Boston like, he's a freak he's in Dumb and Dumb I said he, so I go like this I go he was sea bass in Dumb and Dumb and everybody goes oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bobby was said kids play far too much hockey I mean they're playing 12 months a year even little ones are. they don't need to play the sports and get off the ice for a while have other coaches hang around with other kids other parents I think that is all healthy Parents think the kids have to play for the people to see them. Look, if your kid can play, they will find you. Now, this isn't an anti-hockey comment from one of the greatest hockey players ever lived. It's not anti-hockey. All he's saying is, yeah, you go. Go skate in the ODR. Go skate. Skate. You have to skate. It's a specialized skill. 
you can't not skate if you're going to play hockey. You have to master that that piece of the game. But also, you can go for a run. You know, you can you can hold a lacrosse stick and try to balance on one leg and fire a shot, right? You can go play football. Like that's what we are this morning. Tonight, we, we, I just met this guy and he's super interested in this, which is fun. It makes me really happy. Um, but also, it's like, yeah, I play football, I play hockey, I run track. Fast, fast, fast. Chances are you you got some decent speed, right? It's, it's got to be decent, right? But like that's good. That's good development. So. That was Bobby Wood's thing, right? Found that the weight room is a highly structured, pre programmed environment of controlled stress application. Nobody's going to jump on the kid and just keep forcing them to do something if it looks bad. It's controlled stress. Stress is stress, everybody. Everybody's got it. Everybody sees it. Everybody knows it. It's how you use it. Prior to entering the weight room, a solid level of physical literacy is paramount. In other words, everybody, physical literacy, we need to teach kids how to move well and get them out of compromising positions. <coughs> That's my buddy Anthony. All right, so this is Trey and Zach. All right, Trey and Zach, can't believe that picture right now. Zach's a senior. Trey's playing juniors. Final <laughs> thoughts. Like, here it is. The cap, put the cap in the ball. Athletes learn from trial and error. Hockey is not an early specialization sport. Too, too much specialized focus limits, motor variability, and restricts motor learning for the athlete. Creating a logic catalog creates a more efficient nervous system. Logic catalog. Logic catalog, just more exposure. Expand the athlete's catalog. Focus on the principles that will prevent chronic injury. In other words, you've got to make the exercise fun, but it's got to look right. Okay, we need to move well before we apply load, that's weights. Limitations in movement mean limitations in sport. If the kid's not getting this, his bicep and line with his hand here, then he's probably not gonna be able to do it when he's catching a football. It just is what it is. Strength and conditioning for ice hockey should begin between the ages of 12 and 14. I put 12. Why do I put 12? Because a lot of kids skate so much and they do so much. And it's like, you know what? You gotta you gotta let them breathe. Get these kids in when they're 12. We can do a lot for them at 12. Don't live vicariously through your kid. So commit to it, right? Expect nothing, focus on what you can give, enjoy it, respect it. That's it. Just one percent better. We're trying to get something through an outcome-based approach. So the Kaizen approach, that one percent better deal. How would I live by that in the weight room? Because we want to see kids have some type of constant, consistent success. Meaning, if the kid is bench pressing, and he did 135 for a set of five, and it was clean and it was good, his next set might be 137 or 140. We're going to just move the needle that much, not this much. And then that much over eight to 12 weeks becomes this much. You know what I'm saying? That 1% better avoids injury. You avoid injury, right? I mean, I don't know how many people in here like to work out, but it kind of sucks if you do 135 to five, you're feeling pretty good. And then all of a sudden you go in and you try to hit 185 and you don't even get it off. You're like, well, I just made a 50 pound jump. Why did I do that? Oh, you know, I'm close. Nobody taught me. I thought bigger was better. Yeah, over time. So, look, I'm being courtesy. It's 6.56. I know somebody had to leave before 7. I'm trying to respect that person's time. I have principles in programming. I'm going to pause. I'm going to pause. I've been speaking for about 40 minutes. If you want me to go through the programming piece, I would be glad to. People have to leave right now. I understand. I need everybody's kind of feedback there. Right? I can pause there. I can finish there. I get extra if you need it. If you want it, I've got it. If not, I'm glad we have a card with me. Okay? Here's my highlight. <laughs> I can keep going if you'd like me to. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks for your time. No problem. Nobody else is going to speak up. I'll go. I'll go All right. Cool. People got to duck out. Cool. <laughs>
Uh, I guess just remember this quote, okay? It matters the style, swim with the current. It matters the principle, stand like a rock. It's by old Thomas Jefferson. Meaning we do things basic first before we try to make things complex. We want kids to have a, uh, a taste of early success, especially in the weight room, because they can live in the weight room forever. We don't want them being discouraged. We want to set them up for success. We don't want to look at a kid and go, ha ha, you didn't lift that, you got to get stronger. No, the goal is to get them stronger and faster and more confident through exercise. So we want to introduce basic principles first. And when something new comes along, give it a sniff, check it out, right? So many new things right now. You look at Instagram, you look at Facebook, everybody's doing something new, right? How well can they do something that happened 70 years ago still? There's certain things that didn't leave. That's what we have to continue to focus on. So practical application, this is our system. This is what we do, okay? That's what we work on a constant basis in our sessions. We warm up, pillar prep is core preparation. We do pelvic preparation. We use bands around their hips. Get their hips to internally rotate, to externally rotate so they can feel their glute muscles, which is the primary extension for the ice. We move, we integrate more movement. They go through plyometrics. They go through their speed work. And then after all those elements, now they're sweaty and ready, then they lift. Then they lift. Why? So you don't have an injury because you didn't warm up. The central nervous system is fired. The tissue is loose. The tissue is warm. Everything is moving in the right direction. Coach, I feel ready to lift. We lift, and then we condition. We train power. We train strength. Auxiliary are the supplemental exercises that are going to complement our main exercises and our strength and power blocks those days. So what? What do we do? Is Rocco? Kind of a pain, but we love him. Um, we're a movement-based approach. That's our philosophy. People come. What's your training philosophy? Well, we move kids well, and then we load them bilaterally and unilaterally. Okay? We have an upper body push. When I say push, you have two types of pushes. Everybody's good, right? Still rolling? Upper body push, push up, horizontal push. Upper body push, overhead press. That's a vertical push. We train both planes. Bilateral overhead push. Unilateral push horizontally, right? I'm here. What am I doing? Single arm bench press. Maybe I have a double arm bench press. Okay? Same thing with pulling. Maybe I have an overhead pull down or a vertical pull. Okay, or maybe I have a horizontal pull. Or maybe I have a horizontal pull here. Or maybe a TRX row is a horizontal pull. And then when I go into lower body, it's the same thing. Maybe I'm squatting on two feet, right? Maybe I'm squatting on one foot. Maybe I'm squatting outside my body. Maybe I'm squatting multi-directionally. Looks like hockey. Train all planes in motion. And if the planes look good, in a body weight setting, if they look good, if they're adequate, and a kid's not falling on his face because he can't stabilize in one leg, guess what? We give him something called weight. And then in three to four weeks, your kid's going to look different. That little hockey quad that they got bulging, all of a sudden it's going to go like this. Woo! Right? And you're going to go, oh, man, how's it feel? Feels good. Feel good. Okay? Feel good. Look good. Feel good. We train what purpose to support those movements. We assess it constantly. The reason why I say that, everybody, is, is because there's a logic. It's not just throwing a bunch of shit at a wall and hope that it sticks. There's a logic to it. And that's it. Athletes' goals plus movement demands equals the phase and theme. Hockey players need power or else they're going to skate slow. Okay? Those are goalies, too. You got to laterally, it's called lateral abduction. You got to get from point A to point B. And then you got a bunch of stuff happening right in front of you. So you better be able to move. But then after that, once we find out those demands, we pick the movement type, we split the selection, 
and then the base movement and exercise selection, and then we dictate the volume, load, and rest based on what's the intensity, what is this kid, what can they handle in the month of May? May through August slash September, what can a collegiate ice hockey player handle? A whole lot, a lot. That's when you get, like, that's when you win your national championship right there. That's what you get. You got a good enough team, you got the right horses, you put the work in through May through August, and those guys are healthy, and your your good, good horses are healthy, your four to six draft picks, plus a fourth line who can score goals, guess what? You might be in the tournament, and you might go deep if those guys stay healthy. Those guys stay healthy because of those four to five months. Like this, this, this not, well, actually, you know what, this tangent is there. Yeah, it's called no injuries, which gets you to your final game. So moving forward, that's the logic chain. And it, it just classified, right? There's the movement types, upper, lower, push, pull, bilateral, unilateral, rotational, total body. Again, when I say rotational, we, we train anti-tour. So giving an example of that, everybody, say um, I had this chair, and this chair was getting, you know, becoming a carry, right? So I immediately have to stabilize on the left side of my body. This is an anti-rotational exercise. So if I'm walking, my goal, because this could easily just rotate, my goal is to not rotate. So I have to stay tight, stabilize. And then I can elongate the lever, and all of a sudden, oh, shit, my obliques on. Okay, sorry, guys, we're in a bar. I'm trying to keep it loose, right? <laughs> right? Like, like, I'm here, and I'm walking. Oh, my goodness, I feel this in my, my stomach. This must be a core training exercise. Yeah, it is. It's called a suitcase, carry, And that's an anti-rotational exercise. If I have a goalie, right, two compromising factors for a goalie. Factor number one, adductors. Long groin. Constantly stretched. A lot of goalies like to overstretch. My brother-in-law loves to overstretch. All he does is freaking stretch. Okay? So do you think that Phil's program has any stretching in it? None. It's got no stretching in it. None. Phil comes in off the ice, it's like, don't, don't stretch. Just stretch when you know it. It's like, just go in the background or something. Go in the bathroom. Don't stretch. But going back to goalies, adductors, they, they stretch, they lose. You see 13 and 14 year olds getting hip surgery right now because they're constantly here. Boom, boom. Oh, I'm good. I'm good. Let's just do this for like six straight years and not train it at all. Don't strength train it. Don't bring it back to the medium and activate these muscles. Yeah, no kidding. They're going to have a tear in the hip. Because it's just the same motion over and over and over and over and over with no other stimulus trained but that motion. I'm not saying don't do that motion. I'm not saying don't do that motion. I'm saying you need to train other muscles to support those muscles. So maybe a goalie, instead of going like this in the off season, maybe they need to put a band around their ankle and pull this way and hold it for three sets of 30 seconds. They actually have to feel what their groin feels like when it's on activation opposed to stretch. Then you have a beautiful thing called muscular balance. And in addition, when you've got an anti-rotation exercise, right, if somebody's coming at me and they're trying to pull me and I'm rotating them, that's an anti-rotation exercise. Hockey's, hockey plays are rotational athletes. We have to really teach them how to be really, really, really good anti-rotators which in turn is going to strengthen their lower back spine stabilizers. Now, lower back, everybody, okay, I don't know if anybody's a doctor in here, all right, but that lower back, okay, that thing does not want to rotate past 11 or 12 degrees. It can, but you want to pick up that mobility through your thoracic spine. Just, just think about that. Do we have any spine surgeons in here? Do we? Really? Awesome. So we got a cardio. Okay, awesome. Okay, this is good, right? And I'm good. I'm completely comfortable talking about it. But, like, you're not going to go and tell somebody, hey, go rotate your lumbar, right? Like, I, I mean, you might. I'm not sure. Right? But, <laughs> hey, but like, you're not going to go up to somebody and say, you know what? I want you to rotate in your back with this heavy weight in your hand today. No, like, you want to pick up mobility somewhere else, but that lumbar wants to be stable. You know, him and I are probably going to speak a different language, but, like, so far, I think I'm on the right track in front of Cairo. You never know, right? But we're good, right? I got a thumbs up. You never know, guys. You had a lot of stuff said to me before. Um, power, strength, 
And when I talk about those classifications of movement and lifts, power is developed for a youth athlete. Power is going to be developed with jumping, two leg jumping, one leg jumping, two leg landing, one leg landing. We're not going to excessively mold them in an Olympic lift if they can't jump. And when it comes to a high school athlete, we start introducing Olympic, Olympic lifting to them to create more power in their body. But if they're unable to jump, or if mechanically they're not sound with a PVC pipe or some light weight, we're not going to force them. So that's a, that's a big deal. And I think the takeaway here is you're not going to force a bad movement path. We're not going to. We need to stay away from that. Uh, ESD is conditioning, which everybody hates. Um, conditioning gets worse if you don't lift weights. That didn't mean to rhyme, but it's the truth. Conditioning will get worse if you don't lift weights because you lose the maximization of force production. Your conditioning is going to be really, really hard to prove if you can't participate with more force production to drive that cardiorespiratory system. So we train anaerobic and aerobic. Anaerobic fast interval. Intense 15 seconds, 30 second reps. Anaerobic is the entire 60 minute hockey. Okay? We do both. Have to do both. Anaerobic activity is intense. You're in a red zone. It's hot. Your heart rate is at at least 80% of its maximum activity. Aerobic is used for two things. A, get a general base of fitness. Okay? And in other words, hey, move 30 minutes a day, according to the American Journal of Sports Medicine. I think it's 60 minutes now. Good. Okay? Or B, recover. Get out of the hockey game, go for a 10-minute bike, get a foam roll, have a chocolate milk. That's, anaero that's, aer that's aerobic activity. And then some conditioning is frictional. We'll use the ground. We can run, right? Running would be the first piece of friction. Maybe it's a treadmill. Some of it's non-frictional. Maybe it's a sled push. Maybe it's a rope bath. Maybe it's hitting a punching bag. Maybe it's a rower. Okay? Maybe it's a skate. Yellow zone, green zone, red zone, that's kind of how we determine our conditioning, you know? If we're in red, that's a high anaerobic threshold deck. If we're in green, we're in a moderate anaerobic threshold deck. If we're in yellow, we're in an aerobic threshold deck. And that's that's the menu right there, right? That's that's our warm-up. <laughs> that's our warm-up. Bing, one, linear, lateral, recovery, multi-directional, combo. There's a lot of stuff there. So that's our warm-up. Everybody gets sweaty and ready. It's all kinds of cool things on there too, right? Guess what? It's all basic stuff. We just do it well. We do it well. This thing, this could be the worst program in America, or it could be the greatest program in America. And there's nothing fancy about it. It could be the worst thing if somebody has no clue what they're doing, right? It could be the best, though, if you intentionally coach a kid on every single movement and go, hey, it's going to make you better. It's going to make it better. It's going to make it better. And those are our lifts. You know, it's just a template. <sighs> we just go through all that good old stuff. This is a readiness survey that I did at uh, Minnesota Duluth. See, I didn't have any data collection there. Uh, in Boston, your budget's different. <laughs> Duluth, your budget's different. So what do you do? Do you kick and scream? I don't get no money, right? No, we can't do that. You go, okay, how do I figure this out and become uh, not innovative? Nothing innovative about this. This is just Microsoft Excel. Um, I say, okay, how can I measure this? I'm going to measure their fatigue, their sleep quality, the general soreness, the stress level, mood, appetite, all that stuff. That's what the, this was the women's team. This is what the women's coach wanted. Right? So I did. And basically, everybody, right, if you get a three, you go in yellow. If you get a two, you go in red. If you get a one, you go in red. It's just data collection, easy peasy. But, like, those people that are in pink just creates a convo. Hey, what's up? You all right? You good? What's going on? Yeah, you know, I had a, I had a bad fight with my girlfriend. I had a bad fight with my boyfriend. You know? But then it, it, it creates that conversation, which is really, really significant with a high school or a collegiate athlete because then you're asking them a question. And then you listen. And because you listen, you gain more credibility. And then there's, there's that, there's that connecti connectivity that they might not have with their sport coach, but they have it with their strength coach. 
who they see 99.9% of the time. And that's a big deal. Because of that little Excel survey that took me, believe it or not, it took me a while because I had to try to figure out how to color code things. <laughs> um, it, it, it pays off and you get to know your athletes and that's the best part about it. You have to build a relationship. It doesn't matter how good your program looks. If your program is great but your relationship sucks, it's going to be really hard to give the program to the kid. Just like a client, you treat them, right? You don't want to treat somebody and, uh, you know, oh, I'm going to give you this. Yep, have a good day. But I just told you my life story. Yep, have a good day. Of course, I'm going to come back. So, uh, human performance. What do you want to do? You know, you want to be ready for this one? I learned this from my friend Matt Vanderpan. Matt found this word for me. So when he said this to me, I go, I can imagine, I probably swore, because I've sworn now a few times, and I go, what does that mean, right? Indefatigable. Extremely persistent and untiring. If you create a persistent and untiring athlete, it's not a bad thing, but you do that in the weight room. Um, you do that through strength and conditioning. And that applies to life. That applies to work, that applies to raising a family, that applies to everything that's holy to you. That applies to all of it. And, you know, that's Dario. Had him when he was a little kid. You want to talk about pain in the ass, right? Um, that's just all considerations for hockey. I think the last one's the most important one. Um, I do. Ladders don't create better agility. Ladders are a really good foot warm up. If you want better agility, lift weights and get faster. And it will translate. Goalies are always questionable. Whoever has a goalie in hand, they're a weird human being. And it's 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 not it's not in a bad way, but their bodies just become this wait a minute. Right? And you have to treat it. You and, and I mean wait a minute way. I had a great relationship with every goalie that I've had. But my brother in law, like he's wrapped. He's been playing hockey for the last, like, 20 years, you know? But he's still going. But he trains his ass off. And he's had injuries. Nobody's bulletproof. But he trains hard, and that's why he's still playing, because he invests in his body. You know, I know I'm, I'm going to throw it. Here we go. Everybody here of Tom Brady, right? Well, you know, when you look at somebody like that, that's a guy who took a major, major investment in his body. And his training is it's his holy grail. He also happens to be an unbelievable decision maker. But that's beside the point. Um, yeah, so this is our social media. You can follow it. I got my feed up too. Uh, that's, that's, that's it, guys. I appreciate you wanting to extend this. Um, let me know, if, obviously, if you have questions, right? Uh, I, went, I went for a little while. I know we had till 6 to 8. Got everybody out who needed to get out. So, uh, you know, please ask. Felt like the room had a good vibe. Felt like everybody was engaged. So, um, you know, hopefully I met up, met some expectations. And, uh, yeah, I, again, fire away. And if you have nothing, that's okay, too. But uh, hope I made the hour and 15 minutes worth your time. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody got anything? Anything good? <laughs> I mean, if, and if, you, if you don't have something, it's okay. You, you can hit me up. Uh, give me my number. All good. Well, good. Well, then I guess get another beer. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat. Yeah. Right? I'm going to eat or do what you need to do. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, you. thank you, guys. Thank you. Right. Yeah, I guess, you know what? I guess I do have one thing. <laughs> yeah, I got my own questions. Um, I bet you the conversation after this is going to be, so what do we do, right? Um, I think we try to plan, because obviously there's not a facility here right now. And it sounds like you guys got a lot going on. Um, it sounds like... I know we're in a small town. You guys are going to lean on you a little bit here, but hockey program needs a little bit of a boost, right? 
It's kind of like the Lorax, you gotta let it grow. This is a piece of the puzzle that can really, really make, make that happen. It can be a really positive highlight on a rural community's hockey program. And what I mean by that, it's not a sales pitch, because by now I, I think you know I'm not a salesman. I'm pretty genuine. Like I really I believe in I believe in health and wellness because it makes people better overall. Right? Like if I did an exercise, I'd lose my mind. I just would. Um, I think that the intent here is to try to create a situation for the spring. That would be my advice. To at least get the kids in our facility. It can, it can only be once a week if we need to. Because there's a commute involved. But with that once a week, we can at least give them something called a university workup. And what I mean by that is you introduce them to strength and conditioning. And for 90 minutes, you're showing them, hey, these are the principles that you're going to have to learn to become a better hockey player. It's no different than what they do in the NHL for development camps, right? Coach Axel will go out to Seattle this July. He'll train at our facility. He'll go out to Seattle in July, see all his rookie prospects for a week. And in that entire week, they go through their system as a hockey team. In addition, they're in the weight room all seven of those days. And they're learning how to perform the lifts that are involved in that program. They're learning how to develop as a nice hockey player at 17 to 21, 22 years old. It's no different taking a group of young kids, even if it's once a month, and saying, hey, look, these are the takeaways from today. We can support you virtually if we need to, or we'll see you next week, or we'll see you next month. I think we can get something like that going for the spring. And the price is not going to be an issue because it's very cost effective when you have a group of people like this in the same area. It just is. We have a track and field team at Thompson right now. Um, they come in twice a week. They got 30 something sessions, it's $10 a session. I'm trying to make it fit. I'm not trying to charge high school athletes and I'm in the way. We're in a position where we have a great facility, and our job is to have the social purpose of giving the kids a better chance of being healthier and more athletic, whether it's relative to sport or relative to life. So that's what I'll leave you with. I'll leave you with thinking about something for the spring. Amy and I are in contact a lot. I don't know who else. I was on Zoom with you, John. Yeah. There it is. All right. I, re I remember a few bits. I think so. Um, but yeah, so that, that would be my encouragement, encouragement, right? But now, at least there's a picture painted of the importance of that structure of training. Remembering that, yeah, these, these guys aren't just coming in and just throwing weights around, right? Like, we love kids lifting, but it needs to be intentional. Your kid might squat well on two feet. Your kid might not be able to squat on two feet. It, that's what I mean, right? Like, that, that's the thing. Like, and, and you're a Cairo. You know that every back is built differently. It just, it just is, you know? Everybody is built differently, and we have to be attentive to that. We have to look at hips and look at angles and look at knees and look at shoulders. And what's the body doing? This kid can't press over his head yet. He can't, he can't even press from the floor. Why are we going to have him press over his head? Watch, right? All right, I'm going to stop talking. All right, thank you. The burger bar is on board, so please eat. Oh. They made enough, and what's there is there, and we have to eat it. Thank you very much.